Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for Bright Lights Online. Sorry, we had a little bit of technical difficulty at the beginning of the call, but we appreciate you joining us today. I'm Erin Greenwald from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, and I am so happy to have Bright Lights Online, this virtual series, available for us to recognize our 2020 Humanities Awardees. Um, the LEH has been recognizing people whose contributions to the humanities have helped promote and grow and enrich our state since the 1980s. Um, this series is part of an ongoing program prompted by the current public health crisis. Uh, today, we are joined by Linda and Brittany Langley and Dr. Denise Bates. I'm going to just give you a little bit of background on the logistics of the program. Um, so we can't see you. You can see us. If you would like to communicate with all of the panelists or any of the panelists, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a little icon that looks like two little speech bubbles and Q&A. You're welcome to at any point type in a question that you have for the panelists. Um, into that box. Uh, the, we'll go for about 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and then we'll go into Q&A. Um, I'd like to introduce our moderator. Uh, Dr. Denise Bates is a historian at Arizona State University. She's the author of Basket Diplomacy, Leadership, Alliance Building, and Resilience among the Cushata Tribe of Louisiana, 1884 to 1984. And then our two awardees, our 2020 Lifetime Contributions to the Humanities awardees, Linda and Brittany Langley, they have both dedicated their lives to the preservation and promotion of Kushada culture. Brittany Langley is a Kushada storyteller and traditional cultural advisor. His wife, Linda Langley, is a retired anthropology professor from McNeese State University in Lake Charles. She also serves as the Kushada Tribe of Louisiana's Historic Preservation Officer. She is also co-author with our moderator, Dr. Denise Bates, of Louisiana Cushada Basket Makers, Traditional Knowledge, Resourcefulness, and Artistry as a Means of Survival. Welcome, Denise, Linda, and Brittany. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. And I am so it's such a pleasure to be here today from Arizona State University that sits on the traditional homelands of the Akimel, Oodam, and the Peeposh peoples. Uh, today is as Aaron just said, we're here to talk about the efforts towards preserving and promoting the cultural legacies of the Cushada tribe of Louisiana, which is a decades long effort. So I'd like to begin by first asking the both of you to give us a little bit of background about when it all began. <laughs> At what time did the tribe begin collecting historical materials? You've really always collected. Yeah, just, just about. Um, I probably started when I met Bertney in the late 80s, um, when I first came to Kushada. But you know what I realized quickly was that there was no central repository or place. Um, and a, a lot of the elders and the families would talk about uh, has boxes that they stored in their attic, photographs. Um, and Bertney has always carried around, we call them Bertney's boxes. But, um, and I see, by the way, shout out to all the people who've helped us over 30, 40 years. Um, and uh, Jay Pratt, I see on the phone, and he was one of the first ones to say, can I get a look at Bertney's boxes? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, it began really when we first met and first came, the tribal community came forward and said, you know, there's really been no telling of our story or no central place to, to bring everything. Well, it seems like the Brittany's boxes are quite in, quite famous now at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I had to let all that around wherever I went. Yeah, you would move it from state to state with them. Yeah, they, they've had a lot of traction. They. <laughs> So, so how did these efforts, these early efforts, launch the, uh, the, the development of the Kushada Heritage Department and then subsequently the Kushada Tribal Archives? I think that came about when we first um, 
when the tribe began to get resources to some extent, although even before the casino and the funding, um, I'm trying to think how long ago it was that you made the first, uh, called for the first gathering of people to begin introducing the idea. Was that around 2006? 2000, I think even 2001, maybe the, um, you know, the idea of a historical committee, Kushada historical committee. Um, That's when I was on council. Yeah, when Bernie was on council, uh, it began um, and, and the discussions and everything has really been a, a grassroots, uh, you mentioned 2006 and I think about that was when we began the language project, but um, you know, we were the team approach of somebody who was raised in the community and me, the scholar, I guess, outsider. Um, and Bertney kept saying, whatever we do, the people have to want it. It has to fit. It has to be the way we would do it. Uh, and so, you know, it was, some of it was going home to home and house to house and, and talking to people about this idea of um, gathering together, of, you know, first writing the language, making recordings, um, scanning photographs. Was this something people wanted? And that itself was at least a 10 year or longer effort to get the community not just uh, buy-in initially, but then ownership. It, was, it became their project. And that was really critical to, to get people to see that this as something they, they wanted and needed. Make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. And so, uh, so there was a process that, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that initial gathering. You have this wonderful story about the tables and that the, having the community come out and sign up for different, different parts of this overall project for the history, for the language, for cultural preservation. So I, I was hoping that you could tell us that story. I can tell that story. And also um, another thing that was a big impetus, I think uh, either before that first meeting or right afterwards. So I'll tell both of them if that's okay. But. Um, there, we had a, a meeting of the tribal elders and, um, and really to see what, what it was that they would like to see happen. And the, the idea of writing and recording the language was, was really a big issue and topic to make sure this is what they wanted. And that was life changing for me because they, you know, after the meeting, we talked about, uh, we brought in samples of books, photographs, everything. And, after the meeting or at the end of it, I remember they said to me, we have, we have thought about it. We realize, uh, you know, scholars have come and gone. Uh, really, it's over a century now. And a lot of what they wrote was wrong. And we laughed at the time. We didn't, we said, they're, they're just wrong. That's okay. They'll go back, get their degree, and it doesn't matter. And they said, we were wrong. We see it now and we want you to fix it. And there I was, you know, if, if I was 30 years old, right, 20, whatever I was. And I said, fix like a century of scholarship, like linguistics, archeology, span anthropology, history, fix what? And they said, yeah, that, all that, you, you go fix it. So um, that was life-changing because they, they asked me, they said, we trust you. You, you see what's, where it's wrong, bring it back to us, we'll tell you, and you fix it. And so, um, so then Bertney had the idea of having the big community meeting, which was around 2006, um, and, and very well attended, at least 300, pretty much the whole community, maybe more. And that's the famous story where I said, well, it's such a big project that I'll make tables. You know, I have this Western uh, academic idea of disciplines. Basically, I, I didn't even know what I didn't know. I knew nothing and didn't realize it yet. But, so I, I set it all out. Like, would you be interested in each one had a card? Um, there's a history aspect and the, there was a history table. There's a linguistic, would you like to work on the language? 
would you like to work on uh, photographs compiling? And I had each one as a separate kind of topic and table with a sign up sheet. Would you like to help us do this? And I remember vividly, it was Dan and Janice Silistein were the first ones. Uh, and they've been faithful for this whole time of working on this project. But they looked around and there were so many tables with sign up sheets, they went to each table and signed up carefully. And that's when I, uh, you know, I, at the end, I'm looking at this and everybody, there was nobody in the community who just signed up for one thing, because of course it's connected. It's telling the story of who they are. And it was only in my mind <laughs> that it was separate little topics and areas. So that was another part of my wake up call. But um, we've always had this very vibrant uh, advisory committee. We've called it the Kushada Kosadi Language Committee, the Kushada Language and Cultural Advisors Committee. Uh, but it's this vibrant group of people that we can go to and say, does this sound right? Does this look right? What would you like to see done? Um, would you like to go to an archaeological site, a museum exhibit? Um, can we come together and record words, phrases? And, um, and they have been amazing, uh, amazing part of the story. I talk much more than you. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> That's what I pay you for. <laughs> Yeah, Bertie's famous for uh, getting up. At, it happened to me first at uh, the American Indian Language Development Institute at the University of Arizona. And uh, it was all Indians, teams from, from 30 different tribes. And I, the professor, Susan Penfield, and I were the only non-Native people. And he, he, you know, it was time to introduce our project. And he said, well, we're a small tribe. We couldn't afford, you know, to hire somebody who could help us work on all this. So I took it on the chin and married her and she works for us for life for free. So this our person, <laughs> you tell them the rest. So it's kind of gone in that mode since then. So I was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about the, the Kosati Language Committee and how it functions, how many people are involved and particularly how decisions are made when, when confronted with uh, a historical uh, memory or a word in the language and how that works and how, they, how there's a collective uh, effort towards clarifying some of these things. Well, we had to get the tribal people involved and for them to participate in this project. So we had to figure out a way how to get their attention. So one time we had a meeting we had a, a graduate student from Virginia. Yeah. That had, was uh, working with us. And I said, during the meeting, I said, watch this. I told the, the tri tribal people. And I said, Stephanie, get up here and, and read this book for me. So she went up there and she, she was not, she was, she, she was not a speaker of Kushati language, but she got up there and read the book in Kushati. And all the people were surprised <laughs> that, that they think it could be done. They, 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 they all even got excited after that. <laughs> it was a big splash. We had, um, so for the scholars out there, we had located, painstakingly located uh, heritage materials, archival materials at the Smithsonian, at the NMAI, at the National Archives, at the American Philosophical uh, Society Library. And, and this, these were uh, Bertney's grandfather's rabbit tails, uh, we call them. Um, and so, uh, so uh, they were recorded by the well-known, well-regarded linguist Mary Haas in the 1920s or 1930s, I believe, and had been in that repository. So we, we got them back, we scanned them, they were her notes. And, uh, and Stephanie was a graduate student in linguistics. So when he asked her to do that, she was, um, you know, she just read it phonetically. It was recorded, you know, in, in the uh, international uh, IPA, I think, phonetic alphabet. But, um, but the people didn't realize that the language could be written and read by somebody like that. So that started a process of, okay, let's, 
do a dictionary. Uh, let's, you know, the, from the beginning, I think I have to give a shout out to Jack Martin as well. I don't know if he's on the call, but um, we've been really blessed with great helpers in this project. When the community decided they wanted it, and it's been at least 30 or 40 volunteers that have been there, as I said, for, for almost 20 years working on this with us. But they, um, you know, we said, okay, we'll all get together in a room and, and we'll write the alphabet. Unbeknownst to me that some tribes work on doing that, uh, if it previously hadn't been adopted by the tribal community, you might work on that, that alone for 10 years. We budgeted a day and a half on a weekend to do that. And the way it worked was from the beginning, the tribal people said, we're not going to get bogged down on, in anger, in bad feelings. If, you know, we'll just agree to disagree and move on. And, uh, and so in, even in the multimedia dictionary that we've done to date, which is close to 5,000 entries, it's, it's a lot for starting from nothing, that uh, if different people say a word different way, we, we list it that way. Uh, sometimes we list the initials of the person. If it's six different ways, we have six different recordings. And the agreement is a show of hands, the way that is most commonly said is listed first, and then just goes down from there. So that has persisted, even in the, the way that things can be said differently, different expressions, um, to the point where we've been able to have not just a dictionary, but a teaching grammar, a collection of narratives, a uh, phrase book, and, um, and a, a a, a way of teaching. And we've actually been able to have uh, immersion teaching that has produced second language speakers. And that's very, very exciting for us. That, that is really exciting. So I'm wondering, so is, has there been an evolution though? And how, so there's the, the preservation of the language and capturing it and documenting it and then developing curriculum material from it, but also in terms of the, the heritage uh, preservation, there's also the material culture and there's the, the historical yes. archival materials. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the, that process of collection. I think it all went together. Like the elders first told me that there was no way to just do it, you know, topic by topic. So for example, um, we saw in the old notes by the John Swanton notes over a century ago, something like 20 different varieties of uh, cane basketry. And we began to look around and realize hardly anybody was weaving cane basketry anymore. There's no way to talk about it or have people tell you not just how they did it, but what the different baskets were used for if you're trying to record it in the language unless you get some baskets to show. So we, you know, it all sort of came together like that. You can't talk about the dances or the music unless you bring that in. So one of our first focuses was the basketry because the, the cane and also the pine needle basketry is so central to Kushada culture um, and they're so well known for it. And First was inventorying the collection the tribe had. Nobody had, had done that before. Um, and there, another part came in, Bertney, <laughs> Bertney said to me, we're gonna need more people. And he looked around and found promising young people, high school people, or just beginning college. Heather Williams was one of our first and also uh, Jacob LaBeouf and, and it's a kind of a process where you, he actually knew that certain people would be the right ones from things he observed. Heather had always been interested in making baskets. She was interested in the old ways and some of this. So he says, go to her mother's house and see if she'll agree, because Heather was still in high school, to let her work with you. Uh, to, to inventory these baskets, to go around and, and learn how to measure them and um, identify them and you know, write about their condition. And so I remember going to Loretta's house and standing there and, 
and trying to say all this that we're talking about now and, and say, could I have your daughter come work with me? And at the time we didn't have an office. Uh, we're actually working, we were working out of where the Zoom call is taking place, our kitchen, our kitchen table. And, you know, I remember thinking this lady's gonna think I'm nuts. Like, what am I asking for her kid? And, um, and it really built from there. We've had so many younger tribal members join in, um, get excited. That's one of our favorite things because that gives the, the, the feeling and the, and the reality that the work is gonna continue into the future. Um, and it got, you know, I thought Heather was so shy. She's now the director of the uh, preschool, the immersion preschool on the reservation. But one of our things was to bring them with us everywhere we went. And we went to the, uh, a national uh, indigenous language symposium and Heather was on the panel and I thought, oh, she'll be too, too nervous to say anything. She got up, I spoke thinking it was erudite and wonderful. And Heather got up and said, you want to know how we really made things work? Her ideas were boring. So we, we figured out a way to make everything fun. And everybody in the room was laughing. And at the end of it, one old white professor and I are on the side in the corner. And all the Indians have gone over to, to Heather to say, uh, tell us what you've done. But it was a great moment because I saw it really had become her project. And um, it was a big part of the success is, is bringing the community and especially the younger people. It's when you're a under the bus. Yeah, Bertney turned to me at the at the end of that, and he's and I'm I'm just shocked watching this. What I thought was a shy, you know, young kid, and he says to me, "Looks like your pet just threw you under the bus," <laughs> and he went <laughs> and went over to join <laughs> there, them talking and having more fun. Clearly, um, it's something we talk about in the project too, because now we've found, I think the culture of working in tribes has, has changed to some extent for academics. And we found that people are more open to this and professors, the grad students are coming out understanding better. Um, you know, the, the people know what they want. They know how they want it to be done. And it's important that it, it really is their project. And, um, you know, I didn't get that kind of training necessarily. I kind of learned as I as I went, and they were they taught me fortunately. But um, another part of what we've done is work with universities to get students in to help in whatever way they can: help record, help film, help uh, archive, and and kind of keep that connection going so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel repeatedly. I know you know that, Denise. <laughs> because I've had the pleasure of being part of that, for sure, and having students also be part of it, which is wonderful. Yeah. And so, so my next question you know, really does have to do with the synergy that seems to be happening both within the community, but also with things coming back to the community after many years oh, yes. being gone. And, and you know, I went, was wondering if you would share some of those stories. And some of this has to do with baskets, but there's also historical documents that have been uncovered or misplaced in archives that have been discovered that are actually very critical in understanding Kushada history. Yes. So part of it was um, getting, you know, things from within the community, but a large part of it was also interviews and um, and reaching out to the community outside the reservation. And I know you did a lot of that in uh, basket diplomacy. Jay Pratt also did a lot of that in interviewing people um, that had sort of grown or, or lived around the community for generations. And, and so the interviews themselves document the, the Kushada were always very strategic in building these alliances. And one example is a farmer who lived down the road who had the only tractor uh, when people would have problems or later, you know, they, their car was stuck or a wagon, he would go and pull them out. And the next morning or a few days later, a basket would be left on his doorstep. 
so um, we got an interview with that family, but then several years later, they came when the, when the grandfather died, they came and said, these baskets are the baskets that have been left over many, many decades. Uh, and we would like to donate them back to the community. And we've started, since this has gotten more attention through the LEH and other places, um, sometimes boxes will arrive, emails will come. We wanted to give this back to the Kushada people. Um, and it's been not just that, but, um, but stories, uh, you know, connections that were forged sometimes as much as a century ago. And, um, and people saying, we want to be part of, of returning this or contributing to the archives or giving this back to the Kushada people. So it's been, it's been an incredible testimony to the, um, the tribes, you know, efforts at, at uh, agency and also efforts at diplomacy over, since they've been in the Bayou Blue area for over a century. But why now? Why do you, why would you, why do you think that now is the time that these things are beginning to come back? I, I just find that really an interesting, <laughs> we're in an interesting moment now. And you had an interesting comment about that. It's, the, it's time. Time for the story to be told. Yeah, we're ready to tell our story now. We're, he says, we're ready to tell our story now. And um, it's, it's time, it started happening. And uh, we even were in Basile, which is the next town over. I don't even remember what we were doing, but um, one of the basket buyers in the, I think the 60s, if I'm right, Jose Hebert, a lot of the older people remembered him. And he had helped Ernest Sicky during the years of re-recognition, setting up demonstrations and things. And, uh, and Ernest, if, you, if you're watching, of course, so much of this has come, came from your efforts also. But um, he, Jose Hebert had passed away. And, uh, and I think it was a granddaughter or a great niece came up to us in a parking lot. And she said, I've had this he wanted this to be given back to the tribe and I haven't known who to give it to or where or when, but I see Bertney in the car and I know they'll be safe with Bertney and, and Bertney will get it to the right people. And in the box were, were photographs that we didn't have that Jose Hebert had collected, newspaper articles, I think a yearbook, things talking about Cushada basketry and the community and the basket makers over at least a half century that um, we didn't know about. And to us, of course, that's a treasure trove, just in a parking lot. Yep. It, it seems that these sorts of circumstances are happening, not just with things returning, but also things being uncovered in the archival collections. Yes. I, I know that you have some stories about that. I have stories about that and being at the Princeton archives and finding photographs of the Kushada people misfiled in files that were intended for Alaskan native villages. And yes. I only recognized them because I, I knew what I was looking at. And so I was, was wondering if you might share some of them. The sicky boys, or one of them, you said, yeah, that's Kushada. Kushada. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my favorite story in, in that regard was um, when we first went to the uh, National Archives, Anthropological Archives, and, and Robert Leopold, if you're watching, a shout out to you, this was our first digital repatriation that um, they had you know, over 16,000 pages. But um, in addition to John Swanton, uh, uh, Mark Harrington had visited the community in about 1908, and he was the first person to purchase baskets and record in a slightly different alphabet, but record the linguistic words or phrases that the people told him, as well as the price he paid for the baskets. He did this in about 12 tribes, but one he bought quite a lot at Kushada. And I had heard about this, but I, had, I couldn't find the notebook. And um, so I remember riding around on the bus. I, I, we brought, I brought my son Eli with me. He was about eight at the time. Uh, and, you know, and Robert Leopold, and we went department to department. And I said, that must still exist. It's here somewhere. 
I don't remember what it was misfiled as, but we did find it. And um, I remember we paid almost nothing. They paid, uh, we paid an archivist to by hand to unstitch the, the cloth notebook and to uh, scan, carefully scan each page. It, it's the holy grail. It's the, uh, it's the most amazing thing I've ever found in all my years of doing this kind of work because it, it tells each family who, who made it, what they said about it. There are little sketches in the corner, the words they use, the price that was paid, and those baskets are still there in the collection. And in many cases, we've been able to match up. Uh, and, and of course, that's over a century old. Uh, and then there were other things besides baskets that were purchased. So we're able to, uh, to see, I think we have over 200 items that now we can see uh, who made it and, and all the you know, relevant information. The other great story was recordings that were made by uh, uh, Jack Fisher, a linguist in the 1960s with Bertney's uncle, Bell Abbey, who's a great uh, storyteller, the, the most well-known, I think, in recent tribal history. Um, and I, you know, we had gone household to household asking families, who do you remember, um, you know, being here and when? And, and so Fisher came up and I, I kept looking for the, the you know, um, where are his recordings and that particular summer. And I kept going back to the Smithsonian and saying this, these seven inch reel to reels have got to be you know, that summer in Elton, because that's where he was, and this is how they're cataloged, and they, they were labeled as Italian in the archives. And I finally said, look, we'll pay whatever it costs. They'd still just charge me costs, but um, I said, we've got to get those. Those are not Italian. It can't be right. And sure enough, they were Bell Abbey uh, talking to Jack Fisher and, you know, again, priceless for our collections. But um, so there are many stories like that. Like finding needles in haystacks, in in, in Very its much so. yeah, for sure. And so, so I wonder if you could, and I, this gets a little bit into some of the future plans and what's going on right now, currently with the with the archive. But how are how are these items being organized and being made available to the tribal community? And then also, what how is the process to determine what's to be made available to folks outside of the community? The, um, here the shout out goes to Ranella Fontenot, who's the director of a new tribal department, uh, Department of Historical, I always get it wrong, Cultural and Natural Resources, and Mariana Luquette, who is now the tribal archivist. And they have gotten, uh, they were in the last cohort of the University of Washington's MOOCTU program, which is part co-sponsored by the Institute for Museum and Library Sciences. But um, it's a wonderful open source indigenous uh, based um, uh, data uh, management system, content management system. And that's what the tribe's using. The tags in terms of who can view things or see things are um, all decided by the community in the same way the language project has been done. Majority vote. Uh, we've been slowed down on some of that because of COVID and we have not been able to get the, the big language committee um, together via Zoom. That's difficult. Sometimes when we have those meetings, there's 50 people in the room. So that, that of course, is an issue. But um, that is the, the mechanism. And also, the tribe is working on a, um, a tribal library and archives building that uh, is a, a, the old Capital One building in the center of Elton. and um, and. The basic answer is that anything is available that where the permissions are there, photographs, newspaper stories, uh, images, unless a recording or a story was given only for a certain family, and we do have some of those, then um, tribal members are welcome at any time. The general public, we haven't figured that out yet, but there will be some kind of, um, story maps, virtual tours, uh, and, and guided tours, QR codes. And because the Kushada people are, are you know, have said they're, they'd like their story to be told. They'd like to tell their own story 
in their way. And so some, some permissions, once COVID passes and the pandemic allows, that then the general public will be invited in to view some, I think, of these materials, not all. Uh, some of the baskets are also fragile and have to be kept in a controlled climate and things like that. But uh, tribal community is welcome at any time. So Brittany, what do you think about this, the, the progress that's been made since you had your boxes that you were carrying around the country to different places <laughs> to, to what it is today? And, and thinking about your, and I know that when we initially talked to you, had talked about a several year plan, which is embraces a lot of what Linda just said, but was there anything more that you'd like to add to the, the larger vision of what you hope to see in the next few years? I'd like to see this, this project compl uh, completed <laughs> before I die. <laughs> <laughs> so we can see what's uh, out there. You know, travel people are, are waiting for it. And I'm, I'm sure they'll get it done pretty, pretty quick like now. Mm. Yep. One of our big pushes right now is the um, 50th anniversary of re-recognition, which was originally, which is June 27th, 1973. So in tw by 2023, we want to have these self-guided tours. And I think that will be even faster and sooner again. That's close to ready, just waiting on the pandemic issues. But the, um, we'd even like to have a, a comprehensive documentary. And, um, you know, like Brittany said, these things that have been in process for a long time be completed. And we have a great team. We have uh, not just, you know, everything we've discussed, but a historic archaeology team from the Public Archaeology Lab at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. We have you and your students. We have Jack Martin and his students at William and Mary. Um, we've had help from Tulane and McNeese. And so we have the infrastructure, we have the team and, and we're excited to show people and, and as he said, complete some of this. Yes, absolutely. There are a lot of really exciting things on the horizon. And I just want to point out to those who's listen, who are listening that Aaron had uh, put in the chat box the link to the Cushada Tribal Archive for anybody who would like to learn more about it, about the history and, and some of the things that are happening now. Um, so before I turn it over to questions, because there seems to be quite a few questions coming in through the chat box, I wanted to, to see if there was anything more that you'd like to add uh, to sort of close up this interview, anything that we didn't get an opportunity to address or uh, share. Only that uh, I think we're doing, doing a good job here and I think the tribe is going to appreciate what we've, we've done in the future, looking back at our history and how we came to be where we're at right now. And, uh, you know, one of the things that the was said to me very early on is that Kushada have always been a very a praying people, a, a spiritual people and, um, and people who see the signs of the times. And uh, as Brittany said, it's time. And there, uh, there have been so many people who have been part of this story that I didn't get to name by name, but it's, um, as we said in the introduction to our book, it tells a tribe, it takes a tribe to tell their story. And, and I'm just so honored to have been invited to be part of, of their process and decisions to, to, tell, to tell about themselves. Thank you so much. Now with that, if, with your permission, we'll go ahead and move to some of the questions that have been coming in uh, in the, the, ch the chat box or the, que the question and answer box here. Uh, the first was earlier on, but this is in response to your point, Linda, um, and it reads, have, have some of these misinterpretations made, made it into the wider public knowledge of the Kushada people? And is there stuff we think we know about the tribe that is incorrect? Now that's a big question, but I was wondering if maybe there's a certain uh, yes. example. I would say yes also. I would say yes also. Um, the famous example there is Bertney's mom was quoted again over a, a half a century ago by a, a doctor, someone getting their PhD, 
And he asked her what her clan was. And she said, I don't know. So he wrote the Kushada are losing their language, they're losing their knowledge of their clans and they won't even be uh, existent as a tribe within half, which was more than a half a century ago. But, um, and when I first came across that reference, I, I went to her, she was still alive. I said, mom, why would you ever, her, her clan is on her tombstone. Like, of course she knew it. I said, why did you tell them that? And she said, they would come to us and they, we had chores. Sometimes they didn't realize how busy we were. We learned that the only way to get them to leave was to say, I don't know, I don't know. And it, she said, if you kept saying it long enough, they finally went to someone else's house. <laughs> so some of those errors, yes, unfortunately did get into the record, but um, we're hoping it's a new day, new scholars, and, and again, to correct it as much as we can. That's great. So another question refers to the language and what the process is for words that are new. It's new things such as computers that might not have been immediately clear or didn't, yeah. didn't have an immediate clear study. Yeah. Um, so the short answer is like Heather Williams again wanted to teach colors that um, never made it into the written record or, uh, you know, purple or something like that. So she went around to the elders, came up with suggestions for that and actually brought it to the language committee and said, would this be okay if I use this? And, and they discussed and debated and, um, and said, yes. So when there is the need, other tribes have done this much more than we have. Um, when there has been a need, then that's the process that, that has been used. Kosati has a, um, a way of, of using, they have a ka ending. So like there's no word for book. So pe a lot of people say book ka. <laughs> so um, that's, the, that's another mechanism that borrowed words have come to be used in the language, but it's still, uh, both of them are still in use. Uh, relatedly, as a question having to do with songs and traditions, traditional Kushada songs that are still being sung and, and new songs being written in the Kushada language. So I was wondering if you could speak to that question. That's harder, huh? Yeah. Um, what I can tell you is there's probably people in the chat or on the uh, watching that have done this better than I, but so for example, um, Anaya Williams, who's the current tribal princess is one of our that has really uh, done a lot with singing and with songs and she's worked with Heather and Loretta Williams um, and others to to have a take a song or take if there's a tune that she wants to fit Kosati words and so it matches the tune and sounds right and um, then she'll practice it and go back. We've actually printed our first songbook. Some of them are kids songs, some of them are psalms, but um, it's been done that painstakingly, like the process of the new, of the words coming in. Um, one line at one word at a time, one line at a time, practicing it, singing it in front of the community, making sure it sounds right and then getting it into as many hands as possible to get the feedback. So it goes through the same kind of process of having the community come around and, yes. and come to a consensus, yep. which, is, which is a big thing. Coming to that consensus is very important. <laughs> okay, so this next question has to do with kinship connections and genealogy. Um, and so one of our uh, viewers is asking about uh, finding out about an ancestor that uh, is believed to have married into the Kushada community and how, how she can find out more information about that. We, we do get a lot of those questions as well. Um, would you say we uh, usually send that to enrollment? Yeah, we usually, yeah. Uh, we usually suggest that they connect contact the <laughs> enrollment department um, or, you know, find out if that person was on the roll. Sometimes we, we do 
try and help them and go around and uh, see if anyone remembers this person. Or if we don't send them to one of our sister tribes, um, I think there are folks on, uh, there are Cushadas on the rolls in the Alabama Cushada tribal town of Texas in Livingston, Texas, the Muscogee Creek Nation. And I saw that uh, Raylan Butler's on, the, on this as well. Um, and then also the Alabama Quasarty tribal town in Oklahoma. Um, so if we can't find the person and they're sure they were married to a Cushada, sometimes we'll also put them in touch with another tribe. So, so the main thing is that there is an office devoted to this on, on yes. the reservation yes. that people can, can refer to. Okay, thank you. And it looks like there's one more question unless I'm missing something. So if anybody who's listening still has a question that's burning that you'd like to ask, please go ahead and put that in the question and answer box. Uh, but this question is related to the museum, um, how, how, how you have established a museum to display artifacts. And so to talk a little bit about the, the displays and how things are, are being made available to the public. I would say we're still in the process of doing that. We've had that in the past. The Tribal Museum, unfortunately, um, was a beautiful log cabin structure that unfortunately burnt down. Um, another log cabin structure was renovated for that and then was damaged in the, um, some of the hurricanes that we've had been hit very hard by. So partially the reason for the Capital One building is in, in or the prior one is that that's on a cement slab and uh, has vaults for you know security. Um, but that will have some uh, you know exhibits and traditional form and also some virtual exhibits um, that will be open to the public. And that's a big push for not just us but the Louisiana Department of Archaeology and some of the other federally recognized tribes that um, we really would like to get some of this information to the educational system and to the general public. Well, and I will add, if you wanted to talk a little bit about the, the display at the casino, at the resort, which is a yes. beautiful, beautiful display. Yes, there is a display currently up in the lobby of the Grand Hotel at Cushada Casino Resort, which is located on Highway 165 in Kinder, Louisiana. Uh, just uh, as the crow flies about seven or eight miles from the tribal headquarters, just north of Alta. And so a, a quick question about how many tribal members are there currently enrolled with the tribe? Close to a thousand. Just under a thousand, he says. That was it. The, um, the enrollment is, is uh, you have to have at least one fourth Louisiana Cushada uh, blood to be on the rolls. Great. So another viewer is asking what opportunities there are for non tribal people to learn more about the Cushada people and culture. Uh, he says, I'm particularly curious about basket making and other traditional knowledge of plants and animals and how they have been a benefit to Cushada people for food, medicine, fiber, architecture, et cetera. Is that person one of the reviewers for the book that we, <laughs> we have coming out? On, uh, but I would say uh, to that person in the chat that is the information about the tribal archives and also uh, LSU Press is publishing our book on the Louisiana Cushada basket makers that does specifically talk about many of the topics that you're raising in the question. Um, and that is due out in April. Uh, I think it's already available for pre-order through Amazon, but uh, not trying to you know, promote my own book there, but it has been, there are interviews, um, that span at least 15 or 20 years and a tremendous amount of research. And um, it's devoted specifically to those topics. And I will add too, that there's an intergenerational element to that, especially the interviews, which I think is a process that, that the viewers might be interested in. And the fact that many of them were conducted by tribal members in the language and then went through a process of transcription 
and then reevaluation. So there was more conversation that happened to take place around those initial interviews, which yielded a lot more information, a lot more depth. So that's that's one of the fascinating things I think about that. Very much so. The um, the afterword of the book is written by two women who have. Uh, We've talked about in this interview, um, Renella uh, Fontenot, Renella Thompson Fontenot, and Heather Williams, who are um, fourth and fifth generation of women dis who provided interviews for the books, and uh, and fourth and fifth generation basket makers themselves, and um, and there are also interviews with current basket makers, um, young people in their twenties who uh, are actively participating and shaping the future. And so, so another question, this is getting us back to early 20th century, but um, is about, uh, have you ever heard any stories in the community about Harrington and his collection efforts? I don't think we got, no, I don't think we did. The, uh, that's a great question though. We did find pictures he took, uh, the objects he collected, and he seems um, to have got some pretty candid inter information. So I'm not sure what he did that made it work, but um, I don't remember any specific memories. Of course, that was uh, almost 112 years ago, so. There's certainly a lot of memories in the community of others coming in and yes, asking questions much. and collecting materials. <laughs> and yes. so, which, which speaks to the challenges that you talked about earlier, right? Yes. <laughs> so, well, that looks like we're wrapping up here in terms of questions. So you have a lot of um, congratulatory remarks and a lot of um, expressions of appreciation for your time here. And so now I'd like to turn it back over to Aaron to wrap things up, but I'd like to thank everyone and thank you, Linda and Brittany, for taking the time to uh, let me speak with you. I always enjoy seeing you and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Erin. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for participating in this program. I'm glad that even though we can't see each other in person, that we're able to meet in this virtual environment and share information knowledge um, about the Cushada tribe of Louisiana and all of our Bright Lights um, awardees. Um, this is again, part of a series for Bright Lights Online that recognizes our 2020 Humanities Awardees. Next Friday is our last program in this particular series. It is 11 o'clock Friday, January 15th. And we'll be talking with the Michael P. Smith Memorial Award for Documentary Photography awardee, Charles Lovell. He'll be in conversation with Gwen Tompkins from Music Inside Out. So thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next week.